All right, go ahead and call the roll, please. Uh, Ms. Berry. Here. Ms. Casper. Present. Mr. Hammonds. Present. Ms. Myers. Here. And Ms. Travella. Here. Do we have any Something public comments? No comments. All right. Okay, we would love to hear from our superintendent. Well, I think we have an exciting video, and I believe this first one that we're going to show you uh, has to do with Hispanic Heritage Month and the celebration we've had here at Epic Charter Schools. Jeremy, if you don't mind, just see if we can pull that up. Triple C, this is Fiestas Patrias. We are celebrating Mexico Independence Day. We have lots of food trucks here. There's gonna be live music. There's lots of vendors. And then we also have the kids area where we have bouncy houses, face painting, and some carnival rides. One of the reasons why Epic wants to be a part of it is because we do have such a large Hispanic population. So we wanted to do more community events, also to bring awareness to different cultures and to showcase that. This is our very first event that we're participating in, culture event, and then we're also going to be at Fiestas de las Americas on the 28th. That one celebrates all Latin American countries that celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month, which is September 15th through October 15th. And Epic really, really takes initiative, and they're really passionate about not only cultural representation, but just having our students feel like included. And of course, as you know, one of our five aspirations is building and supporting the community is evident in all aspects of Epic, and so this is an example of that. So, thank you, Jeremy. Thank you. All right, let's hear from, let's see, Trevor, do we have anything on board committee? <clears throat> we met um, today, discussed the uh, slides we're gonna be talking about earlier, and uh, we'll just wait for that, but we did meet and gonna continue to meet every month. And Sarah, how are you on nominating? We um, are working on some dates to get uh, the interview set up. Thank you. Okay, now we're on to 2B, consideration of possible action to approve recommended applications for Pathway High School Completion Program. Has, I have had a chance to review those. Yes, the ad hoc Same. committee met and um, seemed to want to move for recommendation for all of the names. and. You will see at the bottom of that list, we've added a few extra names that, that came in at the last moment. So we'll have a total of, I can't see, 77 names this time. Wow. Awesome. That's amazing. Okay, I to um, accept a motion to approve the pathways obligations. A motion. A second. Uh, Ms. Berry. Yes. Ms. Casper? Yes. Mr. Hammonds? Yes. Ms. Myers? Yes. And Mr. Vela? Yes. All right. Dr. Robert Summers. <laughs> More technology. How's that sound? I think it's loud enough. Good afternoon. We've got some interesting stuff to cover. I'm uh, gonna do two parts. One of them's a little data analytics, and the other one is a little bit of Carver. So we're gonna have a little practice and see how you would handle activities that came to the board uh, for Carver to see uh, progress. Uh, first slide. Here is an interesting, next one. Yeah, here's an interesting slide I ran across You'll recall that we were talking about performance data and how they changed the cut scores basically at the state level to dramatically increase the number of students that passed math and reading in the entire state of Oklahoma. It happened with EPIC students just as much as it did other students. This is a what they call NAEP equivalent score. So what's NAEP? National Assessment of Educational Progress and it's affectionately called the nation's report card. So it's one of the most stable data sets that we have to report on math and reading capabilities. The NAEP proficiency score in this case is 238 on a scale of 500. So we're not talking about way up at real high scores, but the proficiency is about 280. NAEP basic 208. What this graph does is show you where the performance targets by each state 
sits or compares to the NAEP proficiency of 238. So let's walk that through. So Tennessee, its state test results parallel or match the difficulty of the National Assessment of Educational Progress Proficiency. Kind of makes sense? Down here, Virginia has the lowest expectations for students in the country on their state assessment. They all get measured with NAEP scores over time, but that's where they rest. And you'll notice home state of Ohio, slightly above basic, but far from, from the top. Prior to the cut scores being lowered recently, Oklahoma sat number two in the country on expectations for their students in the areas of reading and math. And I thought this was a pretty interesting graphic to show that this, this number will have moved down some level when they report this again. But the first step in achieving, improving student achievement is to have high expectations. And in this case, Oklahoma can be very proud of where it was. Uh, we, we don't know where we are now, but we at least uh, want to be above. Questions on that one? Pretty straightforward process. The next one's kind of interesting. This is our monthly report of how well progress within EPIC is going. It's this formative assessments that we've highly correlated with uh, state test results, which you, you had improvements this year. Some of that was a result of the cuts in the scores, but part of it was your own staff. And I want to point out that the score, this little tiny line down here at 4.4% beginning of the year is the first time in four years that we have a score that beats the goal for that month. So for the past three years, we've been behind all the way through, and this year we're starting out ahead. And I think that Justin and the instructional team and everybody else deserves an applause for the first time ever. And they didn't change the cut score. <laughs> so next slide. That was an editorial comment, right? So the next slide, you'll see the exact same thing in reading. Uh, significantly 4.6. In fact, 4.6 is getting pretty close to the next month's uh, skills uh, target. So we, we have a lot of hope that we'll continue this growth throughout the year. Next one that I want to show you is not so much result. No, that's not your eyesight going bad all of a sudden. That's the blob of all the students that had test score results. So we got math scores up this side. The, down below is the number of instructional activities that the system recorded that the student was involved in. Now, the reason the graphs up here is to show you the intensity with which your data analytics team at Epic is trying to find solutions that can be passed off to the instructional team and to the support team and to make improvements like we just saw. What's interesting is the sweet spot for student achievement is somewhere between 1,000 and 1,500 <laughs> instructional activities. Once you pass 1,500, you start having diminishing returns. And below 1,000, you can see there's a marked change in where that average target is. I want you to look, especially, it's really kind of hard to see, but the darkest part is where the majority of students, and if you'll change this to reading, the next slide. Yep, you'll see that appear even more pronounced. This real dark blob is where a lot of the students are locating. So we've got fewer and fewer students at the low numbers, fewer and fewer at the top, but even in reading and math, they're about the same. 1,000 to 1,500. So it isn't just volume of work. It's the intensity of the work and the, the attention that teachers provide. And I find it fascinating that, that you're actually looking at those things and trying to figure out what best uh, could move progress. 
questions on any of the data? Yes. Could you uh, define instructional activities for me? Yeah, it's uh, anything that the system records that a student has started and stopped a, an exercise, an activity, a printed materials, uh, their, their curriculum, their teachers providing instruction. So it's a fairly broad definition. It's whenever they're engaged. You'll remember we have engagement graphics. Those same in instructional activities are attached to that engagement percentages. Okay. Other questions? Next slide. So this is second go round. We're not going to vote on these today, but we're still providing you an opportunity to discuss. These are the KPIs, key performance indicators for the organization. They're tied to your aspiration statements. Um, Bart talks about those a lot that drive a lot of things that happen in the organization. I wanted you to make sure that we had a chance that you have any questions at all. The top one, of course, is the one that drives us. We want our students to be future ready and in demand. And you'll notice that the the uh, long term, the measures that are not yet in place but are being worked on, the long term A and B, focus on beyond high school graduation. And that's one of the most significant factors in making schools successful is when they don't focus on test scores, they focus on long term success of the students in the broadest sense. Current APIs, of course, the, the primarily the, the ones that the uh, your authorizer or sponsor supports, and also your percentile rankings that we've talked about before. National Leader and Caregiver, NPS, EPIC Students to, and Community Service, you just had a report on that. Also down here, uh, staff retention rate, I would clarify that that doesn't mean everybody, that means the ones that voluntarily, we, we're trying to track who leaves because they decided they wanted to leave uh, because the situation wasn't what they were looking for in, in employment. And so we keep that retention rate high. And then finally, the, the last three are related to innovation, performance, Baldrige Quality Award, and Calmus Ratio, and innovations approved by the system. Any comments or questions that you might have, these will be coming back to you for final approval and uh, some support on the inside. All right, next slide. Here's your four big jobs. This is what you do as a board. You take care of the white areas around the circle. Remember the ends, we had uh, future ready graduate definitions and aspirations. You have your own board work. You have the linkage between the board and the administration and then you have executive limitations on policy. So let's move that from a generic statement and let's see if we, what we come up with on four examples of decision making. So next slide. First question, the board, I want, these are not things that are before you right at the moment. So these are things that you might have come to you somewhere along the line or you may choose to bring something to the board. So as a board, somebody has brought to you the discussion around making decisions based purely on behavior. So we'll forget all the test scores and everything. If a kid acts well, then we'll, we'll move them forward. If they don't act well, we'll make decisions about what they're going to receive in the way of services. And the question is, what do you think of that? So let me just think about it for a minute. Do you have any thoughts about a school that would make all the decisions based on student behavior? It makes no sense to me to make that yeah. decisions that way. So. Not Subjective. In favor. Not in favor? Not in favor. OK. So when this decision comes to the board, should it come to the board or should it go to management? In my opinion, it should go to management. It could be, could be. What about coming to the starts, board? Possibility? Possibly, because it starts getting into what's your mission. 
partly in the mission, but let me think about it for a minute. If you say, look, I really don't like this, and I heard that, right? Mm -hmm. I don't want my school district, who I'm supposedly in charge of, to do this anymore. Where would you place that in your board policies? Go back one slide, if you would. Where does that decision of, I don't want that to happen, land? Is it, a, is it an ends policy for the organization? Is it board operations, board distribution, or executive say, limitations? I would say it's it's limitations. executive limitations. Yeah, think about it for a minute. I don't like that thing that they're doing. Um, it's not, I like this and I want you to do it, or I want you to change your entire school to meet the expectations of what I think education should be. No, that's, that's why we hired Bart, right? And all his team and everything else. In this case, what you have is an executive limitation. You can say, you can do whatever you want, but go to the next slide. Making decisions based purely on behavior? Nah, we're not gonna do that. Helpful? So what makes it an executive limitation is you're saying what can't be done in the organization. Now why, why in the world would I tell the CEO what they can't do? Well, I have a choice. Either tell them what they can't do, tell them what they can do or should do. The can't do is much more freeing because everything that isn't limited is available to make the changes that you need to, and to achieve your end statement. Board ethics statement. So you've decided that the board ethics statement, the word ethics in the board policy isn't sufficient. You think there ought to be more clarity. There's lots of pitfalls in the world today, especially around public education. So would this be something that the board should be working on or management? Seems pretty logical since it's the board's ethics statement, right? I suppose the management could inflict you with an ethics statement, but that's probably not what we want to achieve in Carver Governance. So this one would be on the board, back up a slide. Where does it go? Why is it in your purview? Process and policies. Yep, over here and the decisions about the board's own job, right? And so there's a statement inside this white mark that's already there that says you'll, you'll act ethically. But to bring more clarity to that, bring more precision to that, bring more safety to that as a board, you could ask for a board policy board agenda item and have a discussion or form an ad hoc committee and put that in the board governance process. Next slide. Using gaming technology in the instructional process. You as a board say, I want 50% of instruction to be based on gaming. Board management. 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 Would it ever appear on a board agenda? Not as it's written or not as it's conceived. Kind of makes sense? Mm -hmm. The last one, required data for innovations being created by staff. Now this organization has one of the finest Baldrige-based innovation processes that you'll find. Someday you're gonna be a national winner in Baldrige, I'm confident of that. And when you get on stage, they will want to know about your innovation process. And that it's not a, a random conversation, it's a very precise system. So is that a board action or a management action? I think the initiation of it's board, but the application of it is management. And where would you put it if it was a board decision? Um, trying to remember your... Go back one slide. He's earning his keep today. <laughs> <laughs> You're working your heart, man. Um, the Bottom. 
We're at? The bottom left. Yeah, the management delegation. That's, well, you, could, you can't really do it there because that's transfer without any specific activity. But what you could do is say, look, look, uh, I'm, I'm trying to move innovation in the organization, and I firmly believe that the only way you can do that is if you have targets. And so unless you have targets to, to direct your innovation, we don't want you to do anything with it. And so it becomes a negative. It isn't that you have to have innovation or you don't have innovation. It's you got to have targets before you consider it an innovation. Kind of makes sense? I think I should have left on the third one. I think you guys are much closer. <coughs> helpful at all? Talk to me. Is this helpful in thinking through what comes to the board and what, how you allocate it and where you move it? Yes. Cool. And that is all I've got today. Questions, comments? I have a comment. Uh, we have a special guest with us here today from the great state of Ohio. Bob Summers' better half, Denise. Denise, <laughs> say hi, is here. Thank you for being here, Denise. I, I appreciate it. Thank you, Bob. But, all, but mostly, like, way to go instruction. I mean, yep. that's just, talk about, I mean, it's just exactly what we just talked about, like building the target, having the data collection to do it, you know, and then all the follow through. You know, the, the hard thing about data is it doesn't lie, there's nowhere to hide. Right. <laughs> you know, you just got to take it, whatever yeah. it is. And, you, and having the, uh, the team, the bench, the maturity, the, the, the cognitive space, the emotional space to do that and do it really well, and then to see that, that effort pay off in our, in our student performance is kind of the point. So Amen. I very much appreciate the word. So, all right, we are um, looking at consideration of possible action on 2025 board meeting dates. So every year by December 15th, all schools have to submit a calendar for their regular school meetings in the next upcoming calendar year. And we decided to, to put this out a little early this year. And if you uh, look at some of the highlights, all the meetings will continue to be on Thursday and start at 2 p.m. It seemed to, to work well this year. Uh, once again, uh, there's no regular meeting in March and no regular meeting in December. And these dates will go on the calendar, but if there's ever a need to change, uh, within 10 days we can actually move a regular scheduled meeting or in a shorter time, we can call a special meeting. And I'll move to approve the dates as, as marked. I'll second. Uh, Ms. Berry? Yes. Ms. Casper? Yes. Mr. Hammonds? Yes. Ms. Myers? Yes. And Mr. Vella? Yes. All right, we are back to BART. All right, let's take a look at our superintendent update for October the 3rd, 2024. We are just days away from the end of the first nine weeks. We will be one-fourth of the way done with the school year here in just a couple weeks. So I uh, can't believe how fast it goes. It seems like we were just starting school. So here's our aspirations, which are our North Star. Next slide. So Hispanic Heritage Month, and we had the video that we just showed you, so we celebrated uh, by participating in the Fiestas Patrias uh, here in Oklahoma City, uh, the Oklahoma City Community College to honor Mexican Independence Day, and uh, we're also the Fiestas de las Americas, a vibrant celebration of Latino culture at OKC's Scissortail Park, and then of course the festivities included face painting, a lively parade, family-friendly activities, delicious food, and live entertainment. Um, we also held Hispanic Heritage Spirit Week last week, and you can see based on the specific days uh, what that looked like from a Spirit Week standpoint and, and had uh, uh, several students that uh, participated with us. So uh, very proud of uh, our Hispanic and Latino students, and it is one of the fastest growing subgroups in EPIC. So very good. Next slide. 
so this was this was also uh, something that we participated in uh, called Uptown Out Outside, right off of uh, 23rd and, and uh, the 23rd District, and billed as a celebration of everything that makes OKC special. We had two students and one employee who took to the stage and performed for the crowd, and that one employee is actually with us here today, Ms. Janice Wynn. Yay! Yes. And if you all have not had the opportunity to hear Janice sing, you really need to. She, she sang last year, I heard for the first time, she sang at our graduation last year, and she's a very talented vocalist. All right, I'm gonna stop bragging. Okay, <laughs> next slide. Uh, epic beginnings. So making parenting a, a pleasure is a new free parenting class that will meet virtually beginning the week of October 21st. This is an elective class for students to support them in their parenting journey while assisting to meet their children's needs while they finish school. And so we've got uh, lots of parents that choose Epic uh, that have little darlings and um, those little babies do grow up uh, and we hope that they will become Epic students someday. And so uh, because of our Pathways program, we actually have uh, parents that we are educating and then also we're educating their students. That's the first time we've ever done that. So we've got two generations that we're educating here at Epic and it, it is an honor uh, to educate the next generation. So, next slide. So, a Culture City Sensory Inclusive Program. So, this is the second year we've participated uh, in that inclusion program. Our family engagement team, who does a wonderful job all across the state of Oklahoma, as well as members of the Community Engagement and SPED Department, take part in a sensory inclusive training that provides sensory bags at our events. These bags include headphones, fidget toys, strobe reduction glasses, VIP lanyards, visual cue cards, and weighted lap pads. So uh, we also set up a quiet room at our large expos and other events, like our graduations, for example, uh, for our kids that um, need a little bit more uh, quietness uh, in their life. And so anyway, just proud to, to work with a diverse group of kids um, that come to us for a variety of reasons. Next slide. Ask Epic webinars. So this year we're continuing our Ask Epic webinars. Uh, our series through, it's every Wednesday from two to three, it gives parents and students a chance to ask questions and find out more about Epic. Additionally, all of the webinars are recorded and archived on our website. So this is sort of like what you would call on social media, this is live streaming, where it's back and forth, uh, but it's open to, to the public. And so we have an opportunity and we have a different topic each week. Uh, that we go through these and then we re we place them on our website so if you know a parent's working and they can't make it they can always go back and watch the recording uh, and we bring in uh, different employees and experts subject matter experts whether we're talking about the learning fund or you know we're talking about intervention or student wellness we bring in those departments uh, to speak specifically to our parents and to answer their questions as well next one so we participated in the St. June Walk Run in Tulsa uh, this year again, and it was a success. We had a record number of participants, 76 people, uh, and that is staff, students, and parents, um, and we raised a total of $3,082.36. So Epic is always proud uh, for a wonderful cause, St. Jude, and, and uh, uh, you can see the picture right there. So this, uh, I mentioned this last month to you all. Uh, this, is, this is our new partnership with OU Health. Um, and this is the actual flyer, you can see it's branded up there in the top right corner, that was sent out to all Epic families, making them aware uh, that uh, we are in partnership with uh, OU Health to provide telehealth services to all Epic students all Epic students. And so I think we've got a video right after this, but I wanted to show you that, uh, that flyer that we sent out to, to our families just, just to make them aware of that. So, you know, what we're talking about here, before we click on the video, we're talking about social, emotional, and physical health uh, is really the trifecta. And so I, I'm very proud of that partnership and very proud that we're gonna be able to offer uh, a robust set of wraparound services, and this one will tell you a little bit about it. Go ahead, Jeremy. 
We at Epic Charter Schools are excited to partner with OU Pediatric Physicians to provide telehealth services for our students. A telehealth visit is a way for a student to be seen by a pediatric provider faster than maybe they could get into their regular provider. They are seeing a physician, it's an OU Children's Physician, that they will see telehealthly. They will in person um, meet with a nurse and the nurse will facilitate the visit. Right now, the telehealth services are only available to Epic Enrolled students. So they can't do it from home. The parent or guardian would need to bring the student to either of our locations, the 50 Penn Building in Oklahoma City or the Logan Building in Tulsa. But the doctor is seen remotely. So the doctor is remote, but the parents and students are here in the building with the nurse during the visit. If the child's not insured, there will be no cost to the family. If the physician determines that a prescription is necessary, that physician will call in the prescription to the pharmacy that the parents or guardians have chosen at the time of the visit. Students can be seen through a telehealth visit without parents or guardians being present as long as they have filled out the consent forms beforehand. So if you'd like to enroll beforehand, you'll need to email studentwellness at epiccharterschools.org or you can call either one of our locations. They would call and talk with the nurse to set up that appointment. Just another example of an innovation that we just every single year we are continuing to push the envelope uh, and bring progressive initiatives um, to our students and our families. So very proud of that. And I think we at Epic Charter I Schools. Think, Jeremy, I think that's it. Thank you. Yep. And uh, now we are going to hear from Justin. Here we are. Okay. Um, two things we're going to do today uh, together is we're going to continue to unpack some testing score data um, that the uh, data team has, has disaggregated for us, talk about a few things, um, including adding to what Bob was speaking about with formatives. Um, and then we need to present the annual dropout report towards the end of this presentation. So we have two topics. Um, one is great. One is not so great. <laughs> so again, the, we're talking about our past scores, 23-24. Um, uh, we had a lot more proficiency than we did in 22-23 and 21-22. Um, this just, what, what I wanted to show here, and, and not only to you guys, but for everybody viewing, really, um, is our attendance rate. And, and you would think this is obvious, um, but some people don't necessarily understand. If your attendance rate is 90% or better, you performed better than those that were below 90% by a lot, okay? <laughs> um, and we gather attendance to kind of expand on your question, Mike, um, when Bob was up here, instructional activities are basically our assignments and that's how virtual schools capture attendance. So it can be teacher meetings, any assignment they do in the core curriculum, field trips, um, it's set in law how we can count attendance and those are referred to as instructional activities. And so um, that's what we're referring to here. The next thing we have is teacher tenure and you, you can see the line of uh, regression here shows a teacher that has been here nine years, generally their students perform better than the, than the rest, okay? So this is something that I think we've shown every year since I've been here. Um, there's a learning curve to starting at Epic. It doesn't matter what position you are. Um, teaching is probably the biggest learning curve because you no longer have that book that your school puts in front of you and you're teaching out of that textbook. Now you have about six and each one of your students could be learning from different textbooks or virtual curriculums based off of their choice. So with increased teacher tenure, in comes increased performance. That's why for us, um, retention of employees is, is so important. Th that was math. This is, this is ELA. Obviously, same thing. As you can see, um, the longer teachers stay with us, the better our students perform. A lot of it has to do with relationships, too. 
our ability to loop students um, and, and the ability for families to have teachers for consecutive years um, is another contributing factor. Ah, Bob talked about formatives and that we're above the goal. Well, guess what? Formative mastery is a positive predictor for proficiency. Okay, that's why we focus on that every single month. And to me, this is a huge impact. And so, you know, we report this to you guys every single month and we felt it was important to show the why behind it, that it does actually input, impact um, performance on the state test. This is math and then this is ELA and again, a huge increase. Consecutive year students are enrolled, okay? And this one is a little bit choppy, but I, I would bet if there was a trend line, it would still be uh, a positive trajectory. Students that are in their first year at Epic um, generally don't perform as well as students in their ninth and 10 years at Epic, okay? And part of me thinks those are probably the same reasons as teachers. Um, virtual schooling is a little bit different than what students are used to. Um, so once they get the hang of things, once they get into a routine, which is something that we really try to encourage our families to get their students in as a routine, a, routine, a daily schedule, um, once they get into that, um, we, we really see a positive impact. Questions about any of that data? data? Okay. Moving on to the annual dropout and student college remediation report. Um, this is required to present to you guys by our accreditation officers. Um, this is just a definition of a dropout. Basically, any student who's under 19 who hasn't graduated from high school and is not attending a public or private school um, or receiving an education pursuant for the full term of the school district. Okay, so students that go get a GED, I think there's probably examples. Yeah. If they transferred to an institution, they completed high school, but only by GED. They just left school for an illness, discontinued. Um, quite honestly, all those reasons we see pathway students coming in are reasons that can be used for, for dropouts. This is the calculation. If you want to dive in. Um, and then this is how we compare. So. This is, in, this is in 23, so it, it's, it's a little bit dated, um, but that's just how it's reported to us. As you can see in 2021, um, we were a consolidated district, but that was at 19, then we made a huge decrease to 14.76, and then 15.08 to me is relatively flat. I mean, we're talking about three tenths here, 0.32 tenths, or 0.32. So while we want it to go Decrease, we want it to decrease. Um, staying flat to me isn't a terrible thing. And then this is how we compare to the state. Um, so as you can see, we are, we are higher than the state of Oklahoma. But as you guys know, uh, we have 29,000 students that come here for their various reasons. And it, and it may be because it's their last resort and we respect that. And now that we have the Pathways program to where we can educate them after their they've aged out. I, I really think that's something valuable that, that we can recoup some of this. One of the things that we're currently trying to do is make sure that we have processes in place when they do age out or they do drop out, we actually target those students and identify them for pathways. Anyway, this is how it relates to the state. As you can see, the state did go down um, by half a percent uh, where we relatively were flat. College remediation, this is extremely small. Um, this is from fall 22, okay? So if you think about it, these are students that graduated in May of 22, okay? So this is even further look back, but this is how it's reported to schools from the Oklahoma State Regents for Higher Education. I'm probably gonna get out of camera here. Um, this is still in a time when, when we were not one school. We were multiple schools, okay? So this tells you, this is roughly um, 400, about 550 students. Only about 2% of them needed remediation in college for science. Um, we had about 20% needed remediation in English. Um, about 40% needed remediation um, in math, which we know based off of our test scores, math is an area of focus. 
And then in English or reading, uh, about 23% needed remediation. So again, it, what's difficult about this, well, I didn't even have to do that math, it's right here. Um, what's difficult about this is it's a two year look back. So we know we already have things in place to remediate our remediation, um, but we don't get the results in enough time to actually see it. So it'll be interesting to see this next year and the year after as we, as we um, look back at what we've done the last couple of years. Any other questions about the dropout remediation or the test score data? Not really a question, just, you know, kind of ties into a lot of things that have been discussed at this meeting, but, you know, we, routines and patterns are what's important. And I really look at that and I think about these students and how, you know, the sooner we can get them into a routine or a pattern with these young students, you know, and then, and then how do we hold on? You know, and, and when if they if their pattern breaks or if there's a loss of routine because of illness or a child being born or whatever the issue is that breaks the routine, you know, how do we help them restore that? And I, it's um it's definitely making me think about that as opposed to like behavior and you know not getting lost in those pieces, but staying on on target. So I appreciate the work. Yeah, absolutely. Anybody else, Mike? Um, <clears throat> as far as the college mediation issue. Um, do you have enough data going back to try and correlate a trend so that you are able to maybe predict? It, it just seems like two years lag time is not helpful for Epic at all. Yeah. It's, it's not letting you guys focus enough on writing the ship, so to speak. Yeah, so um, every school in the state of Oklahoma gets the same data two years behind. Um, so that's one thing to keep in mind. The other thing, I mean, our juniors take at the ACT test, which we get feedback from them, um, um, just like we do the state test results. And, and we, I mean, I'm not going to lie, we have improvements to make. Um, our high schoolers do not perform on the specific tests, um, as well as our elementary and middle schoolers. So in terms of prediction, probably based off of ACT scores, um, but that's just, that's one area of weakness that we keep trying to remediate ourselves is, is how we're teaching high school students. I would like to some, at some point see ACT data of, because I'm going through it right now, of trends, what we're looking at, um, how we score, and if you have difference between, if you take it your junior year and your senior year, if there's improvement, okay. if, if that data is available yeah. at some point. We can do that. Anything else? Okay, thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. All right, now we get to hear from Janice. Are you going to sing? No. That was my question. <laughs> It didn't get turned into linen time for me to do that, so it can't be on the agenda. Next time. Yeah. Good afternoon, board members. We are reviewing the financial statements in your packet um, for the end of August. It's the first item on our agenda. Um, we do have the full balance sheet in your packet. Of course, if there are any questions off of anything on that, just let me know. Uh, at the end of August, we had revenue totaling 72 million and expenses totaling almost 56. So the fund balance at the end of the month is 16.2 million, and that's counting a little bit of carryover left from FY24 in August. That gets wrapped up in September. So you'll see that, that line fall off of this report in, at the end of September. So I have a yellow light on the screen, which doesn't happen very often. I'm going to expound, but I'll talk about it first and then I'll explain my why. Revenue is looking good, 22, almost 23%. The goal is 16. Expenses are higher than the goal at 20%. So that's a yellow light. We want to be under that, generally speaking. But here's my reasons. So again, expenses were greater than revenue for the month of August. So we're spending more than we brought in if you look at the month in isolation. So that means you're eating into your carryover. And you can only do that for so many months before it goes away, right? 
Um, so our, our cash flow is what ends up becoming critical at that point because that carryover is basically money in the bank that you can dip into in July when there's no state aid. And then in any other month of the year <clears throat> where you have more expenses than you have revenue, say June when we pay bonuses, we dip into the balance. That's planned every year. So we can even out our cash flow over the next few months. There's a couple of different ways to do it. Our federal claims payments will start coming in usually in November. We may have some as early as October, we don't know. There are a lot of factors that go into that timing. Those are reimbursements that we claim that come to us through the State Department. And so when those deposits start coming in, then your revenue is higher. So your expenses are not more than your revenue for that month. And then reducing expenses. We have a lot of one-time expenses at the beginning of the year that won't repeat in September or October or November. So you'll see that naturally. But we also have some places where we can look to reduce expenses for things where we, we may have planned for a, a, a bigger pie than we're actually serving. So uh, we're gonna be looking at that through the month of October. And when I come back in November, we'll have some updates on that. And the biggest question we have right now is just our student enrollment. We have two more weeks of gathering those numbers, two more weeks of tweaking and maintaining all of our data to try to figure out what that magic weighted ADM is going to be when we get our midterm adjustment in January. So we won't have the official report until December. We try to calculate our own and we're polishing it every day. And we're looking for where could we possibly have this wrong? And it's all facts and math, except for the days that haven't happened yet. So as those days get smaller, it becomes more facts and less estimates. They're very educated estimates, mind you, because this is what's happening today and what we think might happen based on what happened the last 40 days, what's gonna happen in the next five days. So it's not as big of a window as like enrollment, which is looking at years of data. It's looking at just this 45 day period. So as soon as that funding is finalized, which will happen between now and the next time I see you, we will have a more clear picture of what our revenue is actually gonna be for the year. Uh, the only question that will be left at that point is what will the state Factor 8B, what will they actually allocate per student for all students in Oklahoma? And that is not usually released until December. So, that's your fancy four years. The blue is the current year. Now, those big things, those are ESSER, y'all. I mean, we remember big carryovers, lots of ESSER money. And then here's the expenses. So this is, you can see in July and August, our expenses were higher than last year. So that's something that we're looking at to try to see if there are one-time things there or if there are other issues that we need to look at to make sure, and it's an active conversation. You don't wanna jump the gun too early because your enrollment's not done, but you also wanna make sure you're prepared for what's coming and that you're making educated decisions on all of these things in your budget. I, th just a sec, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back. So I was just talking about this a little bit out of order because this is really about the budget, which I haven't gotten to yet, but I wanted you to see it. This is last year's midterm factor adjustment. This is from the State Department, and the column one is where we were in November of 23, and then in column two, they released what it was actually going to be in December, and it went up 37.75 a weight. So translate that to where we are right now, that's one, about $1.5 million. And that is a question mark that nobody can answer right now because it's the entire state's budget for Common Ed. All right, so that's all I have for the financial reports. I'm happy to answer any questions about those um, or if there are any comments, we can take those too, just on the financials. I would move that we accept the uh, <coughs> financial statements as presented. Second. Uh, Ms. Berry. Yes. Ms. Casper. Yes. Mr. Hammonds. Yes. Ms. Myers. Yes. And Mr. Bella. Yes. All right. So the next thing on the agenda I am hoping is the budget update. This is not a big update. We are not asking for any additional spending capacity. This is a little bit of housekeeping. So between June 13th, when you approved the budget that we're currently operating under, and today, we finalized all of our data for last year and submitted it to the State Department. One component of the budget 
is a column, that purple, that is last year. And the last one you saw, it was estimated. There was, we, were, we paid the bills all the way through the beginning of September. So we have to come back in and update that. Most of the time, I'm coming in October with a new budget and we're asking to spend more money because enrollment's going up or whatever's happening. We're right on the bubble right now. We don't know, we think it's, we don't know where it's gonna go. So we're leaving it where it is, not asking for additional funding until we know where it's gonna go, which will be in November. Because of that, I have to do, I have to have this approved with the actuals updated because the State Department requires that I turn this in as part of our version of an estimate of needs. So it, it had estimates when we turned it in after it was approved in June, which is completely normal. This updates that purple column to the actuals. The pink highlight is the, cha or the changes. The whole purple column changed. On the yellow, which is what we're asking you to approve today, the yellow, the, the pink highlight is all that changed. I couldn't highlight yellow on yellow, y'all had to use pink. Um, the carryover is related to actual. So when you get to, I think we have a battery problem. Can, okay. When you get to the bottom of the purple, your total carryover balance, that number has to go to the top of the next year. So now that that's finalized, that of course changes the number at the top of that page. So that purple changed, which changed the total. And again, you're not approving revenue. This is the page you're approving, you're approving expenses. So on this, the only thing that changed is the, re the total revenue and then the, the difference, revenue minus expenses equals balance. So the actual spending is not highlighted. So this isn't a budget increase or a budget decrease. I I'm hoping that that is making sense. Um, what's happening? Because I'm... <laughs> it's like, it doesn't work, it works, I don't really know. Okay, so we finalized our data through OCAS. That was done and locked, and then we've since refined it with the State Department and gone through all of our reviews, so that's all done. And so we are updating the uh, re revenue, revenue for FY25 because of the carryover change. No budget increase. And I just reiterated that that prior budget was approved in June, so we're just seeking approval of the document with the updated figures for the prior year, which then updates the revenue for the current year. So after this, we'll finalize the weights, then we'll get our midterm adjustment, and then I, that same figure. So that is all I have. I'm happy to answer any questions about the budget. I will leave it on the budget page, since that's what you're, the expense page, since that's what you are, really, that's what you're actually voting on today, um, is that number right there. I would move to approve the updated budget numbers as presented. I'll second that. Ms. Berry? Yes. Ms. Casper? Yes. Mr. Hammonds? Yes. Ms. Myers? Yes. Mr. Bella? Yes. Thank you very much, Board. Thank you, Denise. This is a great explanation. Is there anything uh, on the consent agenda that anyone wants to pull out for review? Sure. I move that we approve the consent agenda. Second. Um, Ms. Berry? Yes. Ms. Casper? Yes. Mr. Hammonds? Yes. Ms. Myers? Yes. Mr. Fella? Yes. I move that we adjourn. Second. Ms. Berry? Yes. Ms. Casper? Yes. Mr. Hammonds? Yes. Ms. Myers? Yes. And Mr. Fella? Yes. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so. <clears throat> I'll show this way.